Mayor Sohi, yeah. big budget, the four-year budget. Lots of people have been talking about that tax increase, 4.96, but then also looking at the, the longer term of this, if nothing changes, this could be a 20% increase by the end of this four-year budget. What do you say to people? You know, raising taxes is, uh, is always difficult. Uh, and we looked at uh, all the savings that we could find. We also instructed our administration to find uh, uh, $60 million of uh, uh, reductions within the budget, as well as finding another $240 million of uh, uh, resources that we can reallocate to uh, Edmontonians' priorities. Uh, uh, so, you know, we always look for efficiencies and we continue to do so moving forward. Uh, but I feel that uh, l recognizing all the inflationary pressures that city is facing, uh, uh, we need to find that balance of uh, uh, keeping taxes affordable, at the same time continue to invest in critical services that Edmontonians need and how we can upkeep and repair the infrastructure that we own. So there was a balance that we tried to create. Do you feel like you, you meant that balance? 5% is still a lot for some people. Well, I, absolutely. We understand that there are a lot of Edmontonians who, uh, who are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, uh, you know, had we not looked at uh, uh, increasing taxes, then we would have to cut on services. And uh, uh, any reduction in services or increasing user fees uh, to access those services from public transit to recreation center hurts the most vulnerable Edmontonians, low income, uh, fixed income, and middle income Edmontonians. So it was a balance about keeping our services affordable, continue to invest uh, in, in making services better, uh, and try to keep that balance of keeping uh, taxes affordable. Now, one issue that you've probably gotten a lot of calls about is bike lanes yeah. and, and the price tag on that, that $100 million over four years. Yeah. What does that come, do you know what that comes down to in the, the tax breakdown and how much so, that's? It's very interesting uh, because uh, I, I follow this discussion as well. Uh, I think we need to do a better job of communicating to Edmontonians the benefits of building uh, sustainable, active modes of transportation because uh, 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 they definitely reduce cost for households. If you have a very efficient, safe uh, cycling network that connects different parts of the city to downtown core or other business districts, then you actually reduce the need for that household to maybe have a second car or have a third car. Uh, so which are very expensive. Uh, having a private mode of transportation is very, very expensive from um, uh, purchase from maintenance to insurance. Uh, so I think uh, as well, when I look at the $7 billion that we're going to be investing over the next four years and beyond in the infrastructure, uh, $100 million spread over four years for cycling infra infrastructure only makes 1.2% of the total budget. And we want to build a city for everyone. There are a lot of Edmontonians who cycle, who would like to cycle. Uh, who would like to uh, uh, have a sustainable mode of transportation that is affordable for them, that's safe for them. So we try to build infrastructure for everyone. Uh, you know, we are investing $1 billion in expanding Yellowhead. We are investing millions and millions of dollars expanding Trevilliger Drive or building an interchange on 50th Street and 82nd Avenue. Necessary investments, absolutely important investments. Uh, so sustainable active modes of transportation investments, which are much smaller, are also necessary for Edmontonians to move around. So we all we try to uh, build infrastructure for all Edmontonians. Why do you think people latch on to this one line so? Unfortunately, it's it's. Uh, it, I don't know why. I try to understand like why a small amount of investment in, uh, in uh, active modes of transportation uh, <coughs> creates so much uh, polarization uh, when we don't even question billions of dollars that we invest into other modes of transportation. This is something I'm trying to figure out, but safety of Edmontonians should be on uh, everyone's mind. 
and we know that uh, people die when they don't have safe, segregated, dedicated uh, active modes of transportation to move around, right? Uh, and it's our fundamental responsibility to keep Edmontonians safe. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of safety, uh, the LRT this year was a, a big topic of mm -hmm. safety on the LRT. We did see improvements over the summer, but now that it's cold again, we're hearing again reports yeah. of more open-air drug use, more people feeling unsafe. What's happening there? You know, I, I am I'm really concerned about the safety of our public transit system. We are adding more resources uh, to the safety, uh, uh, and we want to add more as we move forward. Uh, but the root causes of what we are seeing in our downtown, in our Chinatown, on our public transit, particularly LRT stations and LRT cars, are a direct result of lack of investments in mental health, in addictions recovery, uh, in, in ending houselessness. And those are provincial responsibilities. So we've been asking province to step up and live up to their responsibilities that we can build a safer city. We are doing our part. We, in this budget, we will be investing more in affordable housing, in supportive housing, in providing more support to houseless population, uh, in, in encampment cleanup. We are investing more in crisis diversion that we can reduce pressure on policing. Uh, so we're doing what we can, but we don't have the financial capacity or the legislative authority to do so, because these are provincial responsibilities. And uh, I hope that uh, the new leadership at the provincial under, uh, pro uh, at the province under Premier Smith's leadership will look at these things very seriously and step up to fulfill their responsibilities. Now that you've had a bit of time to digest the, the whole task force for that safety mm -hmm. downtown, how are you feeling about that and the way that that was presented to you, to the public? Uh, do you think that it's, it can fill some of those gaps that you've talked about in discrepancies of funding between Edmonton and Calgary? You know, first of all, I'm very pleased that province is uh, creating this task force because it's much needed, uh, long overdue. Uh, but along with this study, they need to start investing now because people are dying. Uh, it's 30, minus 31 outside today. People are sleeping rough in our river valley in the encampments. They have no place to go. We only have one third of the shelter capacity compared to Calgary when our houseless population is actually bigger than Calgary and more complex needs in Edmonton because of the opiate crisis, addictions crisis. Uh, so I welcome, but I also, I'm also concerned that uh, many diverse voices are excluded from this task force. I have not seen any representation from urban indigenous leadership or racialized community leadership or lived uh, uh, people from lived experience uh, or uh, uh, public health experts who can provide perspective on safe supply, who can provide perspective on harm reduction. Uh, what we need is a comprehensive approach, continuum of interventions from safe supply to harm reduction to uh, uh, detox uh, to uh, uh, treatment uh, to uh, recovery to enforcement. Right? I hope that those voices will be included moving forward uh, in the task force or heard from by the task force. Just to know, Chief Billy Moran, former chief of Enoch, is on yeah. the task force. Well, absolutely. The he, Billy will be uh, able to, Chief Moran will be able to provide that perspective. But that's one perspective, right? And uh, there are a large number of uh, organizations working in the inner city of Edmonton who are providing services on a daily basis to indigenous communities engaging with indigenous communities on a daily basis and and working directly with the houseless population. Mm -hmm. And those voices need to be on the table. Okay. Now just on the, the topic of <coughs> Edmonton versus the province, we've yeah. felt a lot of tension, even just as reporters <coughs> and people on the street know there's there's there has been tension and the, the tragic homicides in Chinatown really highlighted this tension. How would you describe the relationship now? No, I always look for opportunities to work uh, 
uh, with our provincial partners and I will continue to do so. Uh, I've been here for more than a year now. Uh, I have been completely nonpartisan. Uh, you know, media asked me a number of times my views on uh, issues that are intergovernmental between provincial and federal government. I have always remained out of those because that's not my area. My role is to defend and advocate on the needs of Edmontonians to every order of government, including province and the federal government. And I will continue to do so and uh, continue to find ways to work with the with the uh, uh, other orders of government to deliver and make life better for Edmontonians. Mm -hmm. Now back to the issue of houselessness. Yeah. Uh, our, our team was out speaking to some people in encampments yeah. today who were saying they don't feel safe necessarily yeah. going to shelters. W how do you see, and this is something the police chief has also raised, that some people just don't want to go to shelters. How do you bridge that gap? First of all, we don't have enough shelters. Second, the shelters that we have do not provide dignity that is required for someone to go there and have, you know, a, a, a war. It's, it's, it's just a mat on the floor in a congregated setting. So there are no minimum standards uh, uh, around shelters. Uh, uh, and some people do not feel safe going to shelters. So where do they do? They end up on the street or in the encampment. It's a crisis that we have. But it's a crisis caused by underinvestment by the provincial government, because these are provincial responsibilities. Tackling houselessness, tackling mental health, tackling addictions crisis and trauma are not city responsibilities. They are provincial responsibilities. We are picking up the pieces and we try to do our best to provide support that we can. But province needs to step up. And they need to really recognize that it's their responsibility that is causing pain in Edmonton states. And they're doing so much harm to the businesses. The broken windows that we see and the disorder that we see uh, in, in Chinatown, in, uh, in Edmonton downtown, is a direct result of lack of investment by the province in fulfilling province's responsibility and is hurting our economy, is damaging our businesses, and our people are dying on our streets. Mm -hmm. Now, on the topic of police funding, I spoke with Chief uh, Dale McPhee this year, and he says lots of the gains that police had in reducing crime were lost when the budget increase wasn't given to them in by the former council. And now in this budget, he's worried to see none of their service packages for things like cameras and vehicles, that they didn't get funding for that. What's, your, what's happening with that relationship? So it's my understanding and during the, this budget, the uh, first of all, police operating budget will be dealt with in April and May of uh, next year. As far as the capital is concerned, uh, police got its fair share of funding. Uh, there was formula or criteria to allocate funding. Uh, city uh, followed that and allocated those funding to the police. Where police put that funding is up to them. Right? Uh, uh, the, the police funding this year is $407 million, Texas Porter Levy. Right? Overall police funding is close to half a billion dollars. Uh, when I look back from 2010 to now, uh, police is tax supported, operational support for police has gone up 60%. And I have never, I have not seen an increase of same kind in other city departments, from public transit to recreational facilities to library, uh, libraries, other critical services that we provide. So we will continue to fund police uh, to the best of city's ability and we fund police adequately, uh, but we also need to balance the needs of the best rest of the corporation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Now, when it comes to that tension between the province, some would say, well, Edmonton, why don't you just step up and fund these things? Any level of government can, can tackle them in their own ways. What do you say to the, that argument? We do, like we try to do our best. We always try to balance the needs of uh, various departments. We can put more money into policing, which means less money for public transit. 
which means less money for fire rescue, which means less money for libraries, less money for crisis, crisis diversion, less money for uh, infrastructure. So it's always a balance. There's only so, much, uh, so many resources that we hope. At the same time, we are funding police. I have deep respect for uh, uh, police, police officers and those who support them to do their work. And they go beyond the call to duty to serve at Minton. And they do a good job of uh, keeping us safe. Uh, we are challenging our city administration to find efficiencies, to do more with less, and look at the organizational structure to, uh, to find redundancies uh, and, uh, and savings. And I hope that agencies that we fund will do the same. Now, another way Edmontonians will really start to see the budget is in paying for parking and needing to pay on Sundays yeah. as well as in the evening. Uh, the executive director for the Downtown Business Association is concerned that this is going to keep people from coming back downtown in a time that there's been calls for more revitalization. What do you say to that? You know, I don't think we have adjusted uh, meter rates for the last number of years at the, at, it, uh, at the same time. Other user fees have gone up. I have seen transit fare going up. We have seen the recreational facilities go up a little bit. We have seen other fees going up. I think only uh, things that had not been adjusted, and these are minor changes to, uh, uh, to the rates, uh, and some alignment of what existed before COVID. For example, 15-minute parking uh, limit was was existed before COVID in business districts, right? So uh, uh, we will continue to monitor these changes. We will continue to work with the uh, DBA and other business associations. Uh, we do provide a lot of support to DBAs, uh, uh, and we are investing more in downtown. We are investing more in Chinatown, and we will continue to find how we can uh, uh, do more and support them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on the topic of the Downtown Business Association, yeah. uh, the Christmas tree, there was some confusion around that, but it highlighted a really tragic vein in our society of you being hit with, with racism as our first mayor of color. What was that moment like for you? You know, uh, first of all, uh, removing, the tree, uh, removing the tree from uh, the Churchill Square was not my decision. It was not a council decision. It was administration working with uh, uh, the Downtown business, business Association made that uh, decision. Um, it was unfortunate that, uh, that some people will restore to racism and threatening behavior uh, without even understanding the context of, uh, of the decision, without even knowing that I had nothing to do with it. Uh, uh, but it was an, uh, I think it was an opportunity to, to engage Edmontonians and talk about that these kind of behaviors are not healthy, that it's not uh, constructive. Uh, I, I serve my community, my city with pride, right? And, uh, and I love Edmonton. Edmonton has embraced me and I have embraced Edmonton and I have grown here. I have. Uh, build my life here, my family and I have succeeded here and, uh, and I'm welcomed to this place. But from time to time uh, you see uh, people's bias uh, come out and uh, expressed without even knowing uh, uh, that it is not rational and that it's not based on facts. Right? So, uh, that is why I'm deeply committed to building an anti-racist city. And it, it's my passion to, uh, to make sure that no one should be targeted because of their race, ethnicity, culture, or sexual orientation, whatever differences that we have, right? So it was unfortunate uh, situation, but you know, we, will, uh, we will continue to work hard to build an, event, uh, build an Edmonton for all of us. Is there something with that anti-racism strategy, if we're talking same time next year, that you hope to be talking about, uh, a win? What is something you want to see in that strategy? I think more understanding among Edmontonians. Uh, uh, in this budget, one thing I'm really proud of, of the additional resources that we're allocating to uh, reconciliation work. 
with indigenous communities moving forward on implementing the recommendations of the TRC as well as the uh, calls to action are coming out of the missing murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry um, as well as implementing the anti-racism strategy. So, uh, you know, these are transformational changes. It takes time. Uh, but I hope that uh, as we move forward that we will be embracing of each other, that we'll be, uh, you know, uh, supporting each other uh, as a community because all of us, all of us, uh, uh, are, uh, we are all Edmontonians and we have a responsibility to take care of each other. Okay. Just back to the budget and yeah. working together with all the other councillors and how the process went. You did have a hot mic moment where you said spending like a drunken sailor. I know you've said that that was, that was just a comment. You didn't mean anything by it. Yeah. But a lot of people look at the budget and how so many spending items passed, but then reductions didn't go through at the same level. And they kind of relate to that comment. And then we did have a bunch of councillors voting against the budget. How has that relationship been? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, we all worked hard to uh, put together uh, reductions to the budget and also additions to the budget. When I look at the data, uh, the all of council members, even those who opposed the budget, supported almost 80% of the increases to the budget, right? Uh, so uh, that actually reflects the need for investments, right? Mm -hmm. Even they realize that we need to invest, right? Yes, they voted against the budget, uh, that's their decision. Uh, uh, but we need to provide quality public services to Edmontonians. Uh, we need to live up to our commitment on reconciliation and anti-racism work. Uh, we need to build infrastructure so Edmontonians can move around safely uh, with choice uh, uh, of uh, uh, how they want to move around. Uh, we need to invest in public transit. We need to invest in snow and, snow and ice control and do better, which we have to uh, moving forward as well, right? So these are the core needs of the city. People want us to take stronger action on climate change. People want us to invest in affordable housing to support struggling Edmontonians uh, and and all of us recognize that we need to make those investments and that's why you see majority of council members supporting additions to the services and additions to the programs in addition to uh, taking those actions. Now on the LRT I know the Valley Line West was a big funding project for this but we're still waiting on that yeah. connection to Mill Woods. I know. Um, we hear that there is progress on the pillars, but it's still, it, it's frustrating. You've said it before. It, it What's has, next? It has been the most frustrating part of my uh, time on city council as mayor, that, uh, that an LRT project that was supposed to be finished two years ago is still not finished. And yes, it doesn't cost us more, but that's no comfort for people living in Millwoods or Bonnie Dune or Strathern or other communities along this, uh, this track that they have no train to take to work or wherever they want to go. And that is frustrating. And, uh, but we will continue to work with Transit. Uh, we want to support them to get this work done and finish the, the line and build it to uh, to the safest standards that are expected to build and uh, and bring it on board as quickly as possible. Uh, so I look forward to the update tomorrow. Any confidence on will we see a train first half of next year, in next year at all, in getting passengers on those trains? I don't know. I think that's something uh, Transit would have to uh, give us a timeline on. Uh, but our primary goal is that we want it to be built to the standards that we expect. Safety is paramount and we need a safe system and I hope that Transit will be able to fix all these uh, defects uh, quickly and, uh, and have the trains running that are safer to get on. Yeah. 
but just to end on a bit more of a positive note, do you have a favorite memory from the last year in Edmonton that you want to share with people? No, I, I, I love being out in the community. Uh, I love listening to people, hearing their aspirations about, uh, about this community. And I remember attending a, a cultural event organized by the uh, Rwandan community to mark the genocide. It was very emotional event, but I heard the resiliency and the strength of young people in that community, how they were turning their pain and trauma and suffering and relating that to other people's pain, trauma and suffering and coming together to build a better city. And that gives me hope that Edmontonians are not afraid to confront our past, but we do it in a way that we support each other, that we lift each other up, and that we're committed to supporting each other and making sure that we're building a city that we all feel that this place belongs to us. And uh, I was so impressed with the young people at that event that it filled me with hope, even though that event was commemorating the tragedy and the genocide and the family members, uh, the community members present lost and have seen murdered in front of their eyes. But still, they embraced hope, right? And, uh, and, and that gives me so much encouragement uh, to, uh, uh, and, and that our city is in good hands, uh, that our city is, uh, is, is this leadership emerging and the present and being built uh, from the past, uh, that, is, uh, that is so inspiring. Perfect, well, yeah. I'm hoping for more hope in 2023. Yes, yes. Perfect, thank good. you so okay. much.